Paul uh, had to deal with that. Uh, just before coming to Corinth, he had been in the city of Athens, and there on Mars Hill, he met with these Stoics and Epicurean philosophers, and they wanted to hear what he had to say. You know that Epicurean, uh, Epicureans were interested in happiness and pleasure, and not necessarily corporal pleasures, bodily pleasures, but just happiness, general well-being, good state of mind. And so that was what their philosophy was all about. The Stoics were stoical. They were presenting an ethical theory, a, a, a moral life of improvement. I don't think either of the two of them had much of a place for the gods in the world of the, of the Greek uh, cities. And so when they gather Paul up to Mars Hill and ask him to explain this new religion that he's preaching, this idea about Jesus and the resurrection, uh, Paul stands up before them and says, I see that in your city you are very religious people. <laughs> and I got to think that Paul is just kind of tweaking them a little bit with that comment, suggesting that with all of their grand philosophies, the common man does not go along with what they have to say. They still are worshiping all the many different gods. So they're not so very powerful or not so very wise in that they have not won over the population. But it's more, Paul twists the knife a little bit further by saying, not only are you very religious, but you are so religious that I observe that you have a statue to the unknown God. You are really covering your bases, aren't you? You're not only worshiping all the many gods that you know, but even if there happens to be some other god out there somewhere, You've got that covered. You're worshiping him too. You don't know what he wants, who he is, or how to worship him, but you've got an altar to him. It'd be funny if it weren't so very sad in terms of the state of the human heart. Paul addressed the wise men of his day and the philosophers of his day and challenged their thinking. They felt that man on his own, by his own reasoning, can understand the world around him and make sense of it and direct himself towards a path of enlightenment that might lead to God, if that's where you want to end up. But it's up to man to make those decisions. A man has to have something that makes sense to him in order for him to accept it. A message. And when Paul speaks of Jesus who was crucified, that doesn't make sense to their rational minds. Why would you follow a criminal? Why would you follow someone who died on the cross? What's the sense in that? There's no reasoning to that. And then this notion of a resurrection from the dead, our sense experience does not confirm that. We have no empirical evidence that anyone rises from the dead. And so therefore they would dismiss Paul's message as just a bunch of nonsense. Well, Paul addresses both Jew and Gentile and presents to them the message of the cross. A place where God reveals both his wisdom and his power in such a way as it confounds the natural man in his own reasoning. Paul makes the point that the natural man in his own thinking has not arisen to a true knowledge of the true God. He's failed. For all of his hankering for signs, for all of his uh, learning and wisdom, he's failed to come to a true knowledge of God. And that must be the case. Man is a sinner. His mind is hostile to the true God and to his message. And so he will not come to the true God. He will do everything he can to explain away that God and instead formulate his own ideas, his own religion in such a way that it satisfies him. There was a, an event in, in France, I believe it was in Paris, at one of the institutes there in Paris, where in 1797 a gentleman was making a presentation for theophilanthropy. And this was at the time of the, the, the French Revolution and, and the Age of Reason and all these kinds of things. And, uh, and the gentleman was making this presentation for uh, an enlightened religion. And one of the guests there 
was a, a gentleman by the name of Talleyrand, and Talleyrand said to him, you know, the thing about the cross, or the thing about starting a new religion, at least in the Christian faith, is that you had to go to the cross and die. <laughs> and he said, I wish you would do the same. <laughs> Blunt and to the point. There's, what place is there in other religions for a cross? Where does the great leader of the various religions of the world go to the cross and die and then rise again on the third day, being witnessed by hundreds of people? You don't see that. Did Confucius die for his people? Buddha? Muhammad? One commentator says that Muhammad was successful at having other people die <laughs> rather than himself. No, Paul preached Christ and his cross because there the wisdom and power of God are made manifest. God's wisdom is found in the cross in that it is alone one way in which our salvation may be made secure. The cross tells us of our human nature it is a sign against us and tells us that all of our efforts have failed. We cannot save ourselves. Our wickedness is such that we must be condemned. The cross tells us this because the innocent one who died in our place suffered for our sins. He had to do that in our place. We needed a cross. We needed something to die for us. If there was not that sacrifice for us, we would perish in our sins. For all of our wisdom, all of our learning, it never gets us out of this dark and sinful world. We are shut up to a world of darkness and sin. There's no hope. Except a cross appears. Except a mediator arrives, who is sufficient in his own person to bear the weight of our sin in himself. Whose righteousness is a human righteousness that properly satisfies all of God's law. In Jesus we have salvation because God's plan is fulfilled. Our sins are laid on Him. And because of that, we can be set free and brought into the kingdom of light. God's wisdom provided a solution that none of us could arrive at. It came from above and entered into this world. What is more, it is a solution that is infused with power. When Christ went to that cross, as we were mentioning earlier, it was the place where death itself died. Christ bearing our sin and dying on the cross conquered our greatest enemies, sin, Satan, and death. They were all put aside. And by His death, He set us free. The bonds of these things have been broken. And we are set at liberty because of the cross of Christ. The power of God is evident in the cross. It's the power of the cross to truly save lives. To make us new in Christ. To enable us to live before God. The cross has the power that nothing else has. It alone can deliver people from their sins. And so as Paul went to the churches of Thessalonica... He marveled and rejoiced in the fact that they gave up their idols to serve the living and true God. What the Athenians, the Stoics, and Epicureans could not do in all their wisdom to persuade the people of Athens to give up their many gods, Paul, in the preaching of the gospel, saw people abandoning their gods, leaving them aside, and following after the Lord Jesus Christ. The gospel is the power of God for salvation. Paul makes that point in Romans chapter 1. I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God to salvation to all who believe, to the Jew first and also to the Gentile. So the natural man will reject the message of the cross and stand away from that message, explain it away, try to uh, soften his tone, uh, dress it up with all kinds of modern notions. We should not follow in that path. We have to be very careful to explain to the people of our day, to our families, to our neighbors, to our workmates, that the cross of Christ is a place of execution. 
And there the Christ died to take away our sin. It was a bloody act of atonement. And it's only by the shedding of that blood that we can be saved. And all notions to try to pretty that up miss the point. We are sinners. We've offended a holy God. We are under His wrath, except we trust in Christ and His cross. Like Paul, we need to preach the cross of Christ, make that central to our preaching, to our lessons, to our life, and live in the light of that cross. I was reading in, in uh, my favorite news magazine, uh, 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 an advertisement for a, a Christian school uh, called the Worldview Academy, which I, 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 I would speak very favorably on, 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 under most circumstances. <laughs> but in, in this particular advertisement, they talk about the need for Christians who are well thought of, or, or Christians who have a, a, a clear worldview and so forth. They say, what really counts is your quiet time, your personal time, alone with God. And I don't want to in any way minimize the importance of a student's quiet time, the privilege and opportunity to read for the script, from the scriptures themselves, to be taught from there, and, and to live in fellowship and communion with Christ. We all need to have that quiet time every day of the week. But in our modern age, there is almost an emphasis on our own personal experience to the extent that we do not need to attend church services, hear the preaching of the gospel, and these kinds of things. We can pick up a, a service on the internet. We, we can listen to the radio or TV. We can have our personal devotions in quiet time. We can get involved in various social efforts. But the church, we're spiritual but not religious. We don't want to be churchy. That's dangerous in this sense. That the church is the place where the preaching of the cross is to be sounded forth. And we need to hear that message preached from those whom God has authorized, like the Apostle Paul. And hear that message with authority. And have that message correct our misunderstandings, our false notions of the cross and the gospel. Our sense that everything is really about ourselves, about who we are. The cross reorients us, and the preaching of the cross in the Christian church is a place where we meet face to face with the Lord Jesus Christ. What really counts? Your personal worship is important. Public worship also is important. You need to come before Christ in His church and have the word of Christ, the word of His cross, proclaimed to you, so that there you might see and understand both the wisdom of God and the power of God. And then you'll be empowered to live with wisdom in the world around you. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the message of the cross that tells us of a Redeemer who gave his life for us, who redeemed us from sin and death, and has given to us eternal life. We pray that this morning, as we reflect on that cross, that we would be reminded that our lives must be centered on the cross of Christ, that all we have and are is rooted in that cross. We ask for the help of your Spirit, that we might be a people that bear that cross, uh, proclaiming Christ to our generation. We ask it in Jesus' name.